Okay, so you've got me for the rest of the day. The next six hours, you'll be sick of listening to me. Um, most of the talks that we've heard so far are really about the interaction between the parasite and the host. What I'm going to be talking about is almost exclusively the parasite. So we're going to do a deep dive into the parasite's genome and really uh, try to tell you how we can use genome-wide techniques to understand at the molecular level what the parasite is doing. Uh, maybe a sort of a, the next stage of that is to try to figure out how it works in the context of the, of the host. But at the moment, really, we are sort of looking at the parasite itself. So how do I get this to go on? Ah, there we go. So I'm going to give you two presentations, one now on genomics and sequence analysis. Basically, what do we know about the parasite genome? What's its capabilities of um, uh, metabolism, whatever? Uh, and then after the break, I'll tell you about uh, looking at the uh, transcription using RNA-seq and then sort of the beginnings of using systems approaches where we're going beyond the RNA and looking at proteins, because the two, as you'll see, are not the same. Uh, this afternoon, after lunch, we're going to do a practical, uh, and I'm going to have, I have four exercises for you. The first one will be using TritripDB, for those of you who haven't used it. Uh, it'll be a good opportunity. Those of you who do know how to use TritripDB, your job will be to help those that don't. Uh, and then I've got some RNA-seq data that I'm going to let you play with, so you can sort of get a little bit of a of a hands-on experience of what it's like to uh, work with um, you know, data from 8,500 genes under a number of different conditions and how you can sort of dive into that and try to get some, some understanding uh, and also give you a little bit of an understanding of, of what the limitations and difficulties are. We're not going to go through the whole RNA-seq platform because that would take too long. but. Uh, Sort of, I, I pre-process the data and you can start playing with it. Okay, so hopefully that'll all work out this afternoon. Um, this is a slide that sort of basically summarizes what we can learn from omics approaches, genome-wide analysis. So we can sequence the genome and we can work out what all the genes are. We can also do epigenetics because it's not just the genes themselves. There's, um, you know, histone modifications, uh, uh, DNA modifications in trypanosomes that influence the expression of genes. So we can look at that uh, at a genome-wide basis now. We can do, uh, used to be microarrays, but now really I think pretty much everyone does RNA-seq, where we look at uh, messenger RNA abundance. In trypanosomes, we can also look at uh, the splice site. Uh, in, in Leishmania, you don't really have very much um, cis splicing, there's only two genes that have introns, so you can't look at uh, alternative splicing there, whoops. Uh, but you'll see uh, that occasionally the parasite will change the splice leader site and that can sometimes affect the expression of the gene. I'm going to tell you about a, a new technique called ribosome profiling, which has been around maybe for five years now, uh, which looks at, rather than looking at just the RNA level, it looks at which RNAs are actually being translated at any one time. And so you can really start to get at a genome-wide scale at protein, or a good surrogate for protein abundance. Um, and then, of course, you can use max spectrometry to really uh, understand protein abundance at the, uh, at the protein level uh, and post-translational modifications like phosphorylation. The problem with mass spec is that you can't look at every single protein because they're not abundant enough. So, so ribosome profiling sort of is a good uh, uh, surrogate of that, much better than RNA-seq, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so this is what genome sequencing was like when I first started sequencing the Leishmania genome in 1996. It took us 10 years and $20 million to sequence the L. Friedland genome because we did it this way. So basically what we did, whoopsie, Basically, what we did was you clone the entire uh, genome up into initially Cosmin clones and then later Bat clones. Uh, you then map those clones by fingerprinting them uh, or by using hybridization approaches. Uh, 
And you know, that takes sort of a year or two to figure out where the order of all of these clones are, and then you start actually sequencing them clone by clone. And so back in those days, it would take us, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks to sequence a cosmid of 30 kilobases which of course was much faster than when I first started sequencing where it would take you uh, a month to sequence a uh, uh, small plasmid. Um, so it was slow, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button. It was slow, but it was very accurate. And the other advantage was that it's scalable. So you, know, you could sequence in a lab, you could sequence a couple of plasmids. So you could have a lot of players. And in fact, right here at ICGB, there was uh, uh, Part, was part of the, um, the Lashminia sequencing effort back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, that was sort of, you know, in the late 90s, that's, that's what we were doing. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button. This, this is what we're doing. Uh, as the sequencing platforms, and actually more importantly, as the, uh, as the uh, uh, computation became better, you could do map-as-you-go approaches where you didn't have to actually map them. You'd, you'd basically sequence the ends and figure out which plasmid, which cosmid was the next one to sequence. And then probably by the early 2000s, you would just uh, sequence the entire chromosome and then later the entire genome by shotgun sequencing. So, so by the end of the project, this is what we were doing. Uh, and you could essentially, uh, the computational um, power had gotten enough that you could actually combine a couple of hundred thousand uh, reads. And these were old Sanger sequencing reads and assemble entire chromosomes. So that's what it was when we started, you know, 15, 20 years ago. What are we, what are we doing now? In Leishmania, there are beginning to be hints of small, you know, miRNAs. Uh, I have to say that we don't really know very much about them. Uh, like, not as much as we do in, in other systems, but I suspect that they'll be uh, found to be important as well. Okay, so 2005, uh, some of you may remember we had uh, the three or the tri-trip genomes were uh, essentially completed. L major was really the only one that was actually complete. The others were, were semi-complete. Uh, and they were all published together in science. Uh, and so you could sort of do interesting things there. This was a, a picture out of that that shows these enzymes which are present only in Leishmania. And you can see that there are some that are not in Leishmania. Etc. So, so this was sort of interesting uh, from a biochemical perspective. Uh, the, the upshot of all this is that really, luckily, Leishmania has a pretty simple genome. Um, there, it is diploid, which makes it difficult to do molecular biology on, but the chromosome pairs were very similar. There were very, very little, uh, very few heterozygous alleles. Uh, there were some repeats, but not too many. There were gene duplications. There were amino acid, tandem amino acid repeats, and then there were some, a lot actually, of interspersed repeats throughout the genome that were later shown to be important in terms of uh, driving um, amplification events, uh, which ended up with frequent amplification, which I'll show you in a, about in a moment. The organization of Leishmania and the other trypanosomatids is sort of unique in terms of, of eukaryotes. Uh, this is a map that shows all 36 chromosomes of L major, each of the little colored bars is a, is a gene, and there were, I think, 8,300 genes altogether. You'll notice, and I'm sure most of you already know this, um, that if you zoom in, you'll find that the genes occur in these polycystronic gene clusters. So on chromosome one, which was the first uh, chromosome that we sequenced, uh, all of the genes on this half are on the top strand and all of the genes are in, on the bottom strand. And in fact, what's really happening is that transcription initiates in this region and goes towards the end. Uh, there can be convergent ones. This is chromosome 4 transcription uh, initiates here and here and meets in the middle. And so uh, often these uh, convergent regions are separated by tRNA genes. And as an aside, we have rec more recently found that these regions here where transcription terminates, uh, you find a DNA modification, uh, which is trypanosomatid specific, uh, known as base J. And I'm not going to say anything more about that, even though that's sort of a, a major part of my lab. So the, the, the finding from this was that in Leishmania, there were only 185 promoters or transcription initiation sites in the whole genome. And in fact, they were always on. So there is no transcriptional regulation. 
people who are used to other systems cannot identify with that uh, concept uh, when they do um, RNA-seq or, or uh, microarray because they always think they're looking at transcriptional uh, activation. But in African in intrapanosomatids, including leishmania, there is no transcri transcriptional uh, regulation. All of the regulation of RNA levels, which does occur, is post-transcriptional. So the modelers, the systems biology modelers, really don't like that because they don't actually have models to deal with it. Uh, which is a pity because, in fact, there's a lot of post-transcriptional modifications and regulation that occurs in other organisms. They've just ignored it until relatively recently. Okay, so what are we doing now? This is what sequencing looks like these days. This is used to be called next generation sequencing. There's now sort of a third generation, so maybe uh, we should call it just high throughput uh, sequencing. There are several different platforms, some of which have gone out of date. Um, they all sort of share the same thing. They, there's no real cloning. They generate generally lots of, of usually short reads, although I'll show you an exception to that. Uh, now long reads are becoming um, more available. And you get draft gen genomes. You can do RNA-seq and chip-seq uh, really at, at a much lower cost. Uh, cost. And, and really sort of the major platform that everyone is using nowadays is the Illumina platform because you can sequence a Leishmania genome for $500 and uh, you'll get your results within a you know, few days. Um, and it gives you very high coverage as you'll see in a moment. So from $20 million in 10 years to $500 and uh, you know, a week, it makes a big difference. Um, so I'll have to say though that, that um, Illumina sequencing is very good for resequencing. It has its problems with de novo sequencing, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But basically, it's pretty straightforward. You just shear your DNA, you amplify it in with the sequence primers on either end, you sequence it on the platform. You can get several hundred million reads on a lane. So if you ran an entire lane of, a, of an Illumina machine, you'd get 600 fold coverage uh, of the Leishmania genome. So normally now we actually run 10. 10 or, or 20 uh, genomes on each lane. Uh, and that will give you plenty of coverage. 50x to 100x coverage will give you more than enough coverage to essentially sample every single nucleotide many times. Uh, we align them against the reference. It's much easier, as I said, to do this if you already have a reference genome. Um, so that can give you things like ploidy and somi changes, copy number variation, and single nucleotide polymorphisms. You can do uh, assemblies, uh, but they have problems with repeats because you've got short reads. Most Illumina reads now are you know, anywhere from 75 to 300 nucleotides in length, and they're usually the repeats are larger than that. So you get this repeat collapse, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so there's a lot of data available. Um, as probably most of you who have been to TriTripDB will fine and I'll show you a moment uh, what's sort of available there. You can go to the GeneDB which is the precursor to TriTripDB that's still maintained. Um, you can go there if you want. The advantage of going to GeneDB is that the annotations get into GeneDB slightly earlier. Um, there's uh, ProtozoaDB which is a, a South American effort which contains things other than just the TRIPS. Uh, you can go to GenBank which is where all of the genome sequencing is supposed to go. I suggest for Leishmania people that going to GenBank is not a good idea because you'll find too many things that uh, are slight variations on one another and, and really haven't been annotated all that well. So you should go back to TriTripDB, um, except if you really want to get the sort of underlying read data, etc., you might go to the small read archive at, at GenBank. Uh, I have in the past talked about TDR targets. I'm not going to talk about it in today, but it's a pretty neat system. I think it's still up and running. They haven't had funding for a while. That en enables you to fiddle with sort of selecting uh, drug targets using various different criteria. And uh, in the past, I've run um, uh, an exercise in that, but I decided to replace that this year. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. So this is the current status of TriTripDB. Um, you can see there's a lot of genomes. Uh, most of the major 
uh, or the, the main Leishmania species have at least one genome. Um, so there's isolates from several of them. Here's the gene counts. You probably can't read any of this. Um, you can see that there's proteomics data sets from a selected number of these. There's RNA-seq data sets from some of them, uh, often not the same. Sometimes they are. There's some microarray data, uh, and then there's even less chip, chip data, just actually from uh, L major, which I've uh, contributed, and from T. brucei, um, from, I've forgotten, I can't remember who did the T. brucei. I think George Cross did the, have contributed the T. brucei data. Uh, and then there's SNP data, et cetera. So, so there's lots of uh, stuff here. This is growing. Uh, there's a lot of genomes that have been sequenced probably in the last two years that aren't there that will be there in the not too distant future. So once you've sequenced your genome, what can you actually learn from it? Well, really, sort of these are the main things that, that you can learn, and I'll go through them one by one. So if you... Um, this is El Shigasi that I did uh, from South America in, in collaboration with Carlos Costa. We sequenced 10 different isolates uh, of El uh, Shigasi. Uh, and then what we're plotting here is the copy number or the, or the read depth, basically uh, converted into number of, of chromosomes for each of the 36 chromosomes uh, uh, by uh, comparing them to the, the El Infantum um, reference. And the first thing you can see is that chromosome 31, there are four copies of this uh, chromosome in all of the strains. Uh, there's actually five in one. So for some reason, chromosome 31 is strange. In, in every uh, isolate of Leishmania, there's at least three copies of that chromosome. Usually there are four. It's also strange, and for other reasons, it has a lower gene copy number. Um, not quite clear why that. It's got a lot of repeats on it as well. Um, you'll also notice that there's a few other uh, isolates where you've got, you know, an extra copy of a chromosome. So for here, this is chromosome 20. This isolate has three copies. This one has two and a half. Well, you might ask, how do you have two and a half copies of a chromosome? Anyone want to venture how you can have that? No? Okay, Hash. Exactly. So, you, so whenever you're sequencing, you're sequencing a mixed population, and if half of the cells in your population have three copies of that chromosome and the other half have two, the average is going to be two and a half. And so that's the problem here. You'll see most of them, you've got less than three copies, but more than two. So there's obviously uh, heterogeneity in the population. And, and I think Patrick Bastian and, and Mark uh, Willett's groups have shown that very, very nicely to be the case. Yes. One question. What if, uh, for example, in the Shmani Mex Mexicana, we have a, a chromosome that uh, um, with a chromosome fusion? Yes. So you will have, you will see if you explore this this chromosome, you will see like the half of the well, not the half, but the part of the chromosome that came from other chromosomes, mm -hmm. like for example, diploid, and the other one is uh, heterozygous. Uh, I wouldn't think that you would say that, see that. So in, in uh, Mexicana, I've forgotten which chromosomes are fused. Um, but basically it has, actually has 34 chromosomes, uh, Mexicana uh, or the whole Amazonensis complex. And uh, the Brasiliensis has 35 chromosomes. So you, if you were to do a similar analysis on, for those genomes, you would actually be doing it against the... Uh, Brasiliensis reference, and you would see the same thing, you, but you'd only have, you'd have one chromosome less. Mm -hmm. If you tried to map them back against L major or L infantum here, you, you'd get a sort of a, a, a result that would look similar to this, but a number of the reads, because they're short reads, would be sufficiently different that they wouldn't map. So it's not a good idea to map again, across species. You should always try to use the same species uh, as your reference. Now, perhaps what you're talking about is on the next slide, right? So this is gene, what I call gene copy number variation. If we look at the gene density across an entire chromosome, if we look at the, the read density across an entire chromosome, this happens to be chromosome 23, uh, 
you'll notice that in some strains, the reed density in this region right here is about two or three times higher than for the rest of the chromosome. So what's happened here is that this region has been amplified. So you've only amplified this small region here. We can't tell based on this analysis whether this is a circular molecule or whether it's a tandem repeat. Uh, because it's the H region, I'm pretty sure that this is actually a circular amplification. Uh, there's another potential amplification in this region here. So you'll see this result saying this region here has a higher copy number than you expect. Now, the secret, the dirty little secret of this is that the reference genome may not be entirely correct because there may be repeat collapses. So you may find that in fact this region here, everyone has more copies than you would expect here because the reference has fewer copies than really exist in the cell. So, so that's where it's important to actually get a good reference. This action happens to be um, L. Donovani in a uh, collaboration that I did with Greg a, a couple of years ago. Um, here's another region on chromosome 16 where the, the red uh, strain here has a, uh, additional repeats of this. And this happens to be actually, rather than a circular amplification, happens to be a tandem repeat, uh, increased number of, of tandem repeats of a, of a hypothetical protein. Um, so you can see that information very easily just by plotting the read depth. Um, and you can see that this strain here doesn't have that extra amplification whereas this one did. And you might hypothesize that this has some functional significance. It really doesn't tell you that it has functional significance, but it's a hypothesis uh, generation. Why did that look the same? All right, so you can also look for sequence differences or um, uh, between the reference and your um, isolates. And, and really, they come in sort of several different types. Really, to be able to analyze that, you need to sort of look at them at the single nucleotide level. So here, you can see that there are little red spots here, which means that the nucleotide at that read, at that position, was different from the reference. Because it only occurs in a single read and not in all of the reads, this is like a sequencing error. Now, obviously, you can't go and look at every nucleotide of 32 uh, megabases, but you have to design your software to eliminate these guys here because they don't occur in most cases. So they're, they're likely sequencing errors. Here, you can see that there are lots of reads that have the same difference, same change at this position here, but not all of them. So here, you can see that these guys have one nucleotide. These reads here have a different nucleotide. So these are probably heteros heterozygous SNPs. So, so one chromosome has this base. The other chromosome has the other base. And they should occur on approximately 50% um, uh, frequency, except if that region or that chromosome has got more than two copies. So using a 50% cutoff could be a problem. You might miss something. Um, on the other hand, here, you can see that all of the reads in this position have a different nucleotide to the, um, the reference. So here, this is likely to be a homozygous SNP, is that in this strain, all, both chromosomes have the same sequence, which is different from the reference. Now, there is another problem that you have. Of course, the reference genome that you've got is a single copy per chromosome. So you don't know whether the reference is a heterozygous SNP at that position or whether it's homozygous. So that is a, a problem with the way that we do analyses is that we typically or almost always use a uh, single version of the uh, two chromosomes as your reference. And of course, it's going to be whichever happens to be uh, of those two chromosomes, whichever one happens to be slightly more representative than, than the other. And so what you're actually looking at is a mixture of both alleles, uh, and they aren't really linked to one another. Now, with, with short read sequencing, there is actually no way to link them to one another because you don't know whether this SNP is linked to this. If this were a heterozygous SNP here, you wouldn't know whether they were both on the same chromosome or one was on one chromosome and the other was on another chromosome. We'll see in a moment that with long reads, you can actually figure that out. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is that this, there's a lot more reads in this position than there are in the rest of the position here. And that's because this is probably a collapsed repeat. Oops. Uh, 
So that's probably a collapsed repeat, which is telling you that your reference was probably not accurate. In the reference, the, the repeats had probably been collapsed. And so if I'd gone back to the previous slide, we would see a higher uh, coverage in that region. When you look sort of at, the ho at a, a larger portion of the chromosome and you plot these SNPs, you can see here uh, that we're, we're comparing L. Donovani, L. Major, L. Uh, and some different L. Donovani from Sudan with L. Shigasi from Brazil compared to the L. Infantum um, reference. And you can see that as you would expect, Shigasi has many fewer changes from uh, Infantum than does, let's say, Donovani or um, from Sudan or from Asia. Um, and of course, El Major has many more. There's big gaps in El Major because probably in this region, El Major didn't actually even align at all. Uh, so really, I shouldn't have done this. It really doesn't mean all that much to have El Major compared to El Donovani. They're too, too uh, distant. What is important, though, is if you compare the Asian Donovanis with the Sudanese Donovanis, you'll notice that they're really quite different. And in fact, they're probably about as different from one another as they are from Infantum. Uh, this one happens to actually be two strains from Sri Lanka, which are slightly different from the Indian strains, uh, but really much more similar to one another than they are to the, this is the Sudanese strain. Okay, so how is this useful? And this is a, uh, out of a paper, uh, a study that, that uh, I helped Greg with a, a few years ago. Basically, what happened was that, that we had gotten, now Greg had gotten his hands on uh, strains of, of um, El Donovani from Sri Lanka, some of which caused visceral disease. In fact, very few of them caused visceral disease. Most of them caused cutaneous disease, which of course is a bit strange for Donovani. So we sequenced both of the genomes and then we compared the two. Uh, and we found a, a modest number of SNPs, um, which I think Greg is in the sort of process of trying to figure out whether those make a real difference. But the most important thing that we found sort of initially was that there was an obvious copy number difference in this region of the genome on chromosome 22, which is the region that encodes this gene called A2, which is a multi-copy gene. And, and I had to actually re-annotate the infantum genome to uh, reconstruct that region because it's a multi-copy gene it had been um, incorrectly assembled. So I, I sort of did that manually and, re and corrected the, the reference. And you can see that the VL strain had a higher copy number in this region than the CL strain. Um, and when Greg then went and did the, Greg's lab went and did the, uh, the molecular biology, you can see that in the VL strain there's actually, I think, one, two, three, four, five, five, at least five copies of the A2 gene. Uh, and they're a different uh, size than the three copies that were found in the CL strain. So there's more A2 proteins in the VL strain. Uh, and that sort of reminds us of a study that we had done previously uh, where uh, we had found that El Major doesn't have A2 genes, whereas El Donovani does. And Greg had shown a number of years ago that that had some role in visceralization. So he took this, this data here, and I hope, Greg, you don't mind my showing this data. I am actually an author on the paper. Um, but I, I chose this as an example of how the genomics data can then be translated into you know, real uh, molecular biology and understanding. Um, so... Um, when Greg knocked out the um, A2 genes in the VL strain, they became less virulent. And conversely, when he took the, uh, the cutaneous uh, strain and added the uh, A2, I think it was a single A2 gene from, from the visceral strain, you can see you, you get this gene, which is really normally present only in the visceral strain, they become more visceralized. So really, I think this was a pretty nice demonstration of why the A2 gene, uh, and in fact, particular A2 genes, whoops, uh, are important in visceralization. Now, I think, um, if I remember correctly, the, the spleen burden didn't go back up to as high as the VL strain. So it wasn't the whole story, but it was at least a good part of the story. So I think that was sort of a really good example of how using uh, uh, genomics could focus you in on the region to do your next experiment because it probably would have taken a, 
a long time or, and or a leap of faith to have found this without having the genomes sequenced. So the lessons that I've learned from, from doing this resequencing are that you have to be careful of sample contamination because we've had a number of instances where we've ended up sequencing what was ostensibly a Leishmania genome and find that a either all or a uh, significant number of the reads aren't from Leishmania. The, the worst case that we had was they have to be from Burkholderia. Uh, there have been other cases where they were from Leptomonas. So you have to be a little bit careful that you're not mixing your samples up. Um, you find extensive changes in SOMI and Ploidy between samples. Uh, that's going to be difficult to, to sort out because of this heterogeneity problem. There's lots of smaller copy number variations that you'll have to go through and try to sort out how many of those might be important. The real issue is that there's generally around uh, a thousand to tens of thousands of single nucleotide polymorphisms between strains. Some of them might be homozygous, some of them might be heterozygous. Trying to sort out what those means is a real problem. Uh, most of them probably don't mean anything, but by just staring at the genome, you can't really know that. And in fact, what sort of what we did in Greg's case was we prioritized those that were in coding sequences that caused differences, major differences in the protein. So, you know, if you create a, a pseudogene by a frame shift, that would be an obvious place to look. Uh, but in general, it's been hard to associate any of these changes with uh, consistently with, with differences in pathogenesis and disease. And the one example that I showed you, the A2 gene, was probably the best example. I think in other cases in the, in the study with, from South America, we really didn't find anything that consistently um, correlated with difference between severe disease and less severe disease. So it's, it's more complicated, as we've heard with uh, the LRV1 story, I think. Now, I want to spend the rest of this talk um, talking about new technology, uh, smart sequencing from PacBio. And why do we like that uh, when it costs $6,000 a genome? It's more expensive. Well, we like it because you get long reads. And so you can fully assemble uh, genomes. And you can also get DNA modification. So really, this is very good if you're sequencing a strain or a species that you haven't sequenced before, this is really where you should start. Uh, and then you can use the Illumina reads to remap against that and sort of do what I've, I've previously shown you. So um, this has really been around for a couple of years now, but it's really starting to become affordable uh, and the, uh, because the, the uh, read counts are going up uh, substantially now, so you can get multiple genomes. So this cost will probably come down to less than $1,000. Uh, in the relatively near future. How does it work? Uh, well, basically what you do is you um, bind a polymerase in the bottom of this well, and then you feed in your DNA, and the polymerase adds nucleotides, which have colored dyes on them, one at a time. Uh, and it can do that. Copy the, it copies the, basically copies the, the genome sort of, uh, or the, the large fragment of DNA, copies it, um, and it can run for tens of thousands of nucleotides. You detect the color signal from a single molecule. This is a difference from Sanger sequencing. When you do this, it's very similar to Sanger sequencing in principle, but here you're collecting the um, added nucleotide from a single molecule because there's only one molecule in each well. And so you're sequencing a single molecule in real time. Um, the problem is that it's not entirely accurate, but you can get around that by sequencing it multiple times. The, the, actually, the molecule that's being made is a circular molecule that has this smart bell on it, so you read multiple times, uh, and so you can average those. And this is what the data would sort of look like if you looked like it. And you can tell, based on the time or, or the color, what, what, um, what nucleotide uh, you've incorporated. So if you put that together in a pipeline, it looks like this. You make your long insert library, and you select for large, if you, if you want to do de novo sequence, you'll select for large inserts, 20 KB and up. You'll uh, sequence them, and you'll get millions of reads. You'll filter and trim them. You'll assemble them into contigs. You'll order the contigs. You'll fill the gaps. 
then you'll correct those sequence errors because unfortunately PacBio does have a problem with, uh, with homopolymer sequence uh, errors. It's not as bad as the old 454 platform, but I shouldn't have even mentioned that because no one uses 454 anymore. Uh, but you can correct them using uh, a program called ICORN, which uses short read information from either PacBio or from, um, from Illumina. And then you have to annotate them. And then at the end of this, you go through and you manually curate them because this is never 100% uh, accurate. So just sort of as an example of how that works, this is uh, the first step. So basically, this was uh, two libraries. So we started, we did one from El Torrentali, and then we've re more recently done El Dorvani. So we've got uh, a library here. This is the Torrentali one. We ran it on 14 smart cells. Uh, we, we got uh, 2 million reads with an average read length of uh, 3,400 nucleotides. So we got about 160x coverage of the haploid genome. Uh, and here's the distribution. So you can see that most reads were about 5 kb. That was the average read length, about 5.4 kb. For Eldonavani, we actually got, it got a little better. The technology had moved along. We only had to run eight smart cells. Um, and they also improved their software at this stage. So so what you do after you've got these single runs initially is you have to actually find out where the smart bell reg region is and you have to trim that off and then you trim off the bad quality reads and you also in these subreads you can combine them if they're from the same molecule you've got multiple copies you can combine them and improve the, um, the accuracy of that read. Obviously that works better for short reads. So if you've got a 3 kb molecule and you sequence it you're probably going to go around you know, 10 times. If you've got a 20 kb molecule, you might get around it once or twice. Um, assemble it. Uh, we like to use HGAP3 uh, assembly. Uh, and so what the assemblies these days do is they do a pre-assembly. So you take just the long reads um, and you assemble those uh, together to really give you good information about how the, uh, the whole genome is strung together. And because they're long reads, you're not going to have this repeat collapse problem. After you've got your, your scaffold from the long reads, you then fill in the gaps with the shorter reads uh, and join them all together. Uh, and so at the end of the day, this is for Eldonavani, we ended up with 143 contigs. So we had uh, the entire genome represented in 143 different pieces which is an average of, what, three per chromosome. Now, in the next step, I'll show you, uh, you can see that the maximum of these was 276, no, actually it was 2,764,947 nucleotides long. And so, in fact, this is chromosome 36. The entire chromosome 36 was assembled into one contact in the first assembly stage. Um, some of the other, contig, uh, other chromosomes had multiple contigs, and what we did was we ordered those by aligning them against the L major um, reference because we knew that was a very good reference, so we, we aligned them. Um, because they were torrentally, they were close enough that you could align fairly confidently. Uh, and then we uh, now had contigs, two or three contigs per uh, chromosome with gaps between them. And in fact, you can see that some of the, uh, this was the L-Torrentally that we did initially, sometimes there were more gaps in, in some chromosomes. Um, but essentially we had the entire chromosome at this stage. What we did then is you go back and you use a program called PB Jelly to try to fill the gaps. Uh, unfortunately, PB Jelly gets it wrong half the time, so you have to go back in and manually correct them. And I trust myself more than I do PB Jelly, but it's a, it's a good way to start. And then you can remap your reads against the, the new consensus and should so that it's, that it's better. So at the end of the day, and then, and then we go through this, I didn't have a slide for this error correction step, which is sort of the, the last step to get rid of frame shifts. Uh, at the end of the day, what we found was that for torrentally, which we did first, we had 38 sequence gaps in the entire genome. So that's most chromosomes had no gaps. A few chromosomes had a few gaps. Um, L. Donovani, we only had 15 gaps. Um, L. Guianensis, we had 29 gaps. Guianensis is more difficult because it has a lot of uh, retrotransposable elements, and so those were harder to assemble. But really, it actually did a pretty good job on these. Uh, Crithidia has a lot of uh, retrotransposable elements, so 
we ended up with more gaps. But really, again, less than one on average. Now, Crophidia has, uh, we compared it to L um, major to try to figure out what the chromosomes were, but what we found, and I'm not, I, actually I'll show you in a moment, is that, that the order of the chromosomes was not the same as in, uh, in Leishmania. It, it had recombined many chromosomes and split some apart. We started trying to do euglena, uh, and we haven't actually, I, you'll notice that I don't tell you how many gaps we have here, because currently it's a lot. Uh, so the euglena genome is, is proving to be difficult. Uh, and just an example of how this might improve, if you go to TriTripDB, you'll see the Leishmania genome here, and it has currently 4,400 sequence gaps in it. So I don't know if any of you have been to TriTripDB and looked at your favorite gene in l -Tarentally, it's often going to have X's in it. Um, our assembly, as I said, now has only 37 gaps, and most of the chromosomes, it's not shown on this one, um, actually have telomeres on either end. I should go to the next slide. This is El Donovani. You can see that, that most, 28 of the chromosomes, we have telomeres on at least one end. In fact, both ends. We have most chromosomes, we have, we've gone from the telomeric hexamer repeats on both ends. Sometimes we stopped a little bit short. Uh, and so, as I said, in, in this current uh, Donovani, I think we have, uh, where was it? Back over here. <laughs> we only have 25 gaps in the, in the entire uh, genome. Um, we've now re-annotated this and the gene count is out to 8600. So we found more genes because the current uh, reference for Eldon Ivani has a lot of sequence collapse in it and a lot of gaps. So this is really a, a quite a bit of an improvement. And this is what you're going to play with this afternoon. Um, uh, and as I said, we've done Elgianensis in collaboration with Steve Beverly, so we've got a much better assembly. Those of you who are familiar with, with the Brasiliensis assembly in TriTripDB will know it's really pretty lousy. This, we've got 25, I think 25 gaps in the entire uh, genome again, and we've got most of the telomeres. Uh, and you can see that probably about half of the telomeres have uh, Tates, these uh, telomere-associated uh, transposable elements at one or both ends. And then there's Crithidia. You can see Crithidia, right, we think, has 35 chromosomes, but the chromosomes are generally recombined versions of, of the Leishmania chromosomes. So I think here, chromosome 1 in Crithidia is the uh, equivalent of the first part of chromosome 2 in Leishmania. Chromosome 27 of Crithidia is part of chromosome 24, 19, uh, the rest of chromosome 2 and 33B. So there's been recombinations uh, between um, in Crithidia because they're on a different line. Um, we were able to uh, map lots of retrotransposable elements in Crithidia. You can see we've mapped 140 different retrotransposable elements. And you'll notice that most of them uh, are at telomeres, although there are a lot of internal ones as well. And in fact, the next slide we found that probably half of the retrotransposable elements were right at the telomere, uh, and they looked like this. This is the telomeric hexa repeat. There's a, a short subtelomeric sequence, then a Tate element, uh, and then you go into the protein coding genes. There were also a lot of them that were in strand switch regions, and in fact, they were in uh, regions where there were breaks in synteny. So here, this is a, a, a Crithidia gene, a Crithidia chromosome, and this represents the part that's syntenic with uh, chromosome 1 from Leishmania, and this is syntenic with part of chromosome 9 from uh, L major, and there's a Tate between them. So potentially the Tate is why the, this recombination occurs. We also find them often at strand switch regions uh, and then in repeat uh, expansion loci. So we think the Tates in, in Crithidia were really responsible for a lot of the recombination that we're seeing in these and, and the, um, the South American um, Leishmanias. Now, I told you, oops, I told you that PAC biosequencing can also measure base modifications. Uh, and the way that that happens is that if there's a modified base at a particular nucleotide, it slows the polymerase down slightly. And so, uh, you can tell that this should have been an A, for instance. I'm not certain that that's true, but let's pretend that it is. I think it is. Uh, 
This should have been an A, but in fact, the polymerase didn't like it that much. It, it was slightly slower. This interpulse uh, duration was slightly higher. So it was probably a modified A. In this case, it was probably a, a methylated um, A. You don't find these A's and C modifications in Leishmania and, and trypanosomes, but what they do have is they have this base J. And so base J has a rather complicated uh, signature that has uh, pauses at 0, plus 2, and plus 6. And so we're able to use that uh, somewhat successfully to map precisely where the J's are uh, in the um, Leishmania genome. And so if you zoom down to the single nucleotide level, you see that there's a, a J here, and you can see this is a, there's actually a J here, and that's the 0, plus 2, plus 6. Uh, and when we, when we looked at these and compared them to um, similar data from individual plasmids, we got essentially the same answer. So we're pretty confident that we can use this to map where J's are throughout the entire genome. The last slide, or almost the last slide, is where are we going next? So potentially single cell sequencing will be useful because that may get around this problem that we have of mixed populations is you, you sequence the genome from a single cell and you compare you know, several different cells in a lesion, for instance, and that way you'll see what the differences between, if any, are between uh, different parasites in the same host. Uh, and you won't sort of average everything else. Now, whether this turns out to be successful or not remains to be seen. Uh, the thing that I worry about is that you need to have a, uh, an amplification stage in there, and if the amplification is not, uh, is biased, you're going to end up with um, coverage problems. But, but it'll be interesting to do this, and I know that Jean-Claude Dudajan has already started uh, doing this analysis. Uh, so we'll see how that, that comes. Of course, what this will mean is that you now, instead of having a single genome for each of your strains, you'll have tens or hundreds of genomes. So the amount of data that you're going to have to analyze uh, is even more. Uh, 